Genesis 26, uh, I've titled tonight's message, Repeating the Past. And uh, since it has, uh, it feels like it's been a month or so since we've, we've actually been in Genesis, uh, let me take just a moment to give us the big picture once and again. Uh, remember what we see here uh, as we're opening up the Bible in the Old Testament and working our way through it. Uh, we see a specific plan. And that specific plan is unfolding with specific characters. This is called the patriarchs, right? Uh, we saw the creation of the world, and then we saw God kick his plan in, you know, somewhere there around uh, Genesis 12, which will take us all the way through the end of Genesis, Genesis 50. And in that, the, 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 the track that God has, the, the, the main focus of what he does is he uses four main characters. They're on the screen for you here. You probably know them all by heart, but it's Abraham, Isaac, uh, Jacob and Joseph. This, this is it. This is the main tract of what he's, he's walking through, uh, you know, walking um, through the annals of history, through, through the, uh, uh, the plan, the promise, the focus. It leads us all the way up to what we just read in Matthew 24. All of that focus, here's the, here's the genesis of, of all that, right here in the book of Genesis, the start of it. And in today's Bible study here, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the second one. You know, there's this little... Uh, parenthetical here, you know, chapter 26, that gives us a little bit more details here regarding uh, Isaac and everything that was going on in him. And, and, and what we're going to see is we're going to see this picture, a little expanse of his life. Uh, and, 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 and we're just going to do the best we can to look at it here. Uh, and so I did number one is this, following by faith. First five verses, they tell us this. It says that there was a famine in the land besides the first famine. And that was in the days of Abraham and Isaac. He went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. Now, let's just stop right there for just a second. We're going to throw up on the screen here a, a particular map. It's important to you because you're watching this stuff and you're hearing about this stuff right now. Might as well take a look at it. Now, forgive the map. The map is stretched, but it, you'll, maybe you'll find the picture here. Okay, we got the Mediterranean Sea over here on the left-hand side. Some of you have been to Israel with me. There's the Dead Sea right there. You can't miss it right there. Uh, we got Egypt. Oh, look at that. There's a little arrow down to Egypt right there, right? This is Canaan across this area. Uh, big picture Canaan. Philistines inhabit that coastal area. That's it. They're a, they're a seafaring people along the coast. That's the Philistines. Oh, maybe you might recognize the name Palestine. Okay, that's it right here. This is what you're looking at. Now, as you see, um, well, what did we just read here? We just it said that he went... Uh, to the land of Philistines, verse number one, in Gerar. Can you find Gerar right here? Yep. All right, this is just right, right next to the left up here. Guess what that is? Gaza, Gaza Strip. That's it. That's the whole deal. Now, uh, we're going to find this here uh, perhaps in a few minutes, and I'm trying to get my bearings about this. Gosh, I, I don't like that map because that map confuses me, and I just I copied that map. Gee whiz. Maybe leave it there and we'll figure out what happens. Okay, we'll see what goes on. So, so back in the text here, um, again, Genesis 26, verse number one. Okay, we, we can understand here um, that, that what happened uh, with Isaac is that he went to the land of Gerar. It says, in verse two, it says that the Lord appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt and live in the land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants, I give all these lands and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham, your father, and I will make your uh, descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands. So whose land is this? This is God's land to be given away. And, in, and, and as we're here in the very beginning, the promise came to Abraham being passed down through his sons because what we're looking at is the program of God regarding the, the, the land, the chosen land of what he promised. And uh, whether it be Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, they did not get the, the full inheritance of that. The conquest came through, uh, through Joshua. And even in, in the conquest of Joshua, of taking this allotted territory, Canaan, which Philistines would be the... Uh, again, those are the, the, uh, on the, on the coastal there of the Mediterranean. But watching the news, you see Gaza. You see Ascalon, which is in Israel proper right now today. Same thing with Ashdod. You see that little space of land right there that is still highly contested as of right now. But it really, in technicality, it's all God's. And he, and he gave it to 
uh, what we call Israel, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people and all that stuff. And even though they have passed and taken and passed and taken and all that stuff, rightfully according to the promise coming back into Genesis, it is the people of God. It is the Jewish people. And so I just want you to understand that. And so uh, what happened with, with all of this? Well, uh, we, we find in this story here, following by faith, uh, that in verse number one, verse number one, it references the famine in the time of Abraham. And, and, and what happened with Abraham? Well, Genesis 12, verse 10 down through 13, I'm not going to go there. You can just reference it. That, that this is Isaac's father. And, and, and we know that Abraham, that he faced a trial of faith. It was a severe famine that took place in the land. And, 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 and rather than remain in the promise of God in this promised land, well, Abraham, he waffled a little bit. And, and, and the circumstances moved him to a place to where he didn't stand on the promises of God. He moved into an area because he just didn't see the evidence. He, didn't, he, he wasn't connecting the dots, if you will. And he moved out of the area down into Egypt where God did not want him to go. He was to remain in the promised land. And this type of story of when trials come into our life, listen, this is repeated all through the scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, your life, my life. The trials come. There's promises that we have in God. And, 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 and man, some, somehow we just, we forget the promises of God and then we waffle in the practicalities of our faith. And, and, and let me give you a couple examples. I'm gonna give two examples because I love both of these examples. First one is in the book of Ruth, Ruth chapter one. We got Elimelech and we got Naomi. You remember that at that time they're living in Bethlehem and uh, you know, this is just south of Jerusalem uh, and, and, and a famine rolled through at that time. And what did they do? They, they left the house of bread, Bethlehem, and they went down to Moab, which is God's wash pot. And, 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 and in Moab at that, at that moment where, where Bethlehem was experiencing the famine, in Moab, well, there wasn't a famine. The, you know, the things were well. And so they wanted to play it safe because, it, well, this is our life and, you know, we're married and we got kids and all of this stuff. And so, so going down to Moab was a representation of them playing it safe. They sought relief on their own abilities, distant or separate from the will of God. God did not want his people to relocate to Moab because changing countries specifically for a Jewish person to leave uh, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, you know, some of the tribal areas across there and go to a pagan country. Basically, it was like, dude, you straight up just backslid and you're just denying the faith. That was, that was the tonality that came from it, whether they said anything or not. And so uh, in the end, what happened with those two, Elimelech and Naomi? Uh, you know, that's what the book of Ruth is all about. Well, in the end, it was a devastating decision that that husband and wife combination made there but it took a decade for the ramifications of it to come to full fruition. You remember that, they, they, that the husband died, that the two sons died and all of that stuff and Naomi was faced and left. You know, she made her way back up into Bethlehem uh, you know, with one of her daughter-in-laws and all of that stuff, but it took a while for that to, to all come out. That was an example of a situation being so stressed and, and opposed to remaining in the, in the care, in the promise, in the place where God said, that, I'm gonna take care of you right here. They waffled and they took off. Abraham did that. Now, there, there, there's more in this that we should understand. And that is this, is that growth in the Christian faith, it happens as we follow Jesus with steps of faith. And we know that is certain because Hebrews 11 and 6 tells us that for without faith, we cannot please God. In other words, we only grow as we take steps of faith. And, 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 and if I could take the language and maybe make it so that it's personal, I would tell you that many times it's risky following the Lord. Risky. So, so, so if, if we're talking about faith for sure, but we're realizing that practically speaking, as we're seeing the examples here in Genesis, in the book of Ruth, the characters, people, real life people, that there's risk in walking out the life of faith. Because what if God doesn't uphold his promise? What if God doesn't do what he said he's going to do? And yet at the same time, is there really any risk in following the Lord and trusting the Lord? No, there's not. Because nothing is too hard from him. And his character is certain and true. 
And if he said it, he's gonna do it. He's gonna take care of it. And there are many times where, where we just don't understand what God is doing. And there are also times that God allows us to go into places of suffering so that we would learn the lessons, so that we would grow in character, so, so that we would realize that, 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 that the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking and all of that stuff. You know, all, all of the pleasure components that we get if we, wanna, if we wanna live a reckless life here by partying and hanging out and having no real responsibilities. No, 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 God has something more than that. And there are, there are times when God calls us to do something that rages against all natural logic. No, well, that can't be true, Jeff. Well, are you sure? Have you considered Gideon in Judges chapter six and seven? Because what, what happened here with, with, uh, uh, with Gideon, uh, it's, you don't have to follow along, but it is just to your right there. It's right at the front of your Bible. But, it, but in Gideon, or in Judges with Gideon, I should say, that God, God called him to do something absolutely crazy. He says, he says, go and tear down that altar of Baal. Uh, let me interpret that for you. He was tearing down the city's statute here and, and even stuff that his dad had and that meant that he was taking his own life into his hands. Imagine dropping into Gaza, you as an American, before the war that happened, and going into the city square and just desecrating something there. Would it go well for you? Probably not. You may not leave the same way that you entered, okay? Now you understand. You get it. You get where Gideon and what he was doing. And God called him to tear down the altar of Baal. And then God called him right there, right in that thread of just looking through chapter 6, chapter 7, okay? that God called him to take on 135,000 Midianites. Judges, chapter eight, verse 10, you'll see the number, the calculation of the number there. And, 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 and oh yeah, why, why initially it looked pretty cool because he had tens and twenties and oh, maybe just over 30,000 people at first. Oh, this is great. But God says, tell them, hey, if there's anybody that is here and, and, and afraid and scared, go home. And 22,000, they bolted out on him. And then he's got, he's, you know, he's got a remainder of 10,000. Well, okay, uh, 10,000, well, we're the super elite. We're IDF. We're going to get this done, you know? <laughs> nope. God says you still got too many because in your own pride, you're going to think that it was you and how great you were. Take them down to the brook. And uh, uh, some of you haven't, I, actually, I would say most of you that has gone on the Israel trip, I've never taken you to this spot. Although it's right in the way that we go. Hey, you have to go again. I'll have to show it to you here. <laughs> All right. And, and he takes 10,000 and he pairs it down to 300 committed dudes. And, and this, is, this is spectacular. This is amazing. The, the, the AR-15s that they're given and the fighter jets that they're given, right? Because we got 300 guys taking on 135,000 people. What they're given is amazing. Oh, it's, it's spectacular. Let me read it to you. You could look in Judges 7 and 16. They are given trumpets, pitchers, and torches. That's their weapons. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Following God is not always reasonable, okay? We can understand that from the Old Testament to the New Testament. But here's what we're to learn. You'll see this on the screen here. This is, this is the lesson here. That God calls the man. God strengthens the man. And God fights for the man. In Judges chapter 7, verse 21 and 20. Two, it would tell us this. It says that every man stood in his place all around the camp. This is the camp of the Midianites. And the whole army ran and they cried out and they fled. And when the 300 blew the trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword. This is the Midianites. He set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp. And the army fled to Beth Acacia towards uh, Zerah, uh, as far as the border of, of Abel, and, and he, he kind of tells us a thing. Uh, the whole idea is just nothing more than understanding this, is that sometimes God calls us to do some crazy things. And now we're back in our text here of, of Genesis 26, and we're seeing the son of Abraham. This is Isaac and the years that have passed and all of that stuff. And we come to our second idea of the night, and that is a lapse of faith. Uh, verses 6 all the way down through, through 16, uh, we, uh, we find, it says that, so Isaac, he dwelt in uh, Gerar, and the men of that place asked him about his wife. Now, who, who was Isaac's wife? You remember her name? It starts with an R? That's right. That's right. Uh, was she a, uh, a half-sister to Isaac? Say no. no. Okay, good idea. All right, good job. Now, was Sarah... Uh, was, was she a half-sister to Abraham? Yes. Yeah, okay. Different deal here, okay? This is the son. And what does he say when he gets down there? Well, she is my sister. I wonder who he learned that from. Huh, that is so strange. 
Why? For he was afraid to say that she is my wife because he thought, lest the men of that place kill me for Rebecca because she is beautiful to behold. Now, stop, pause, and just take a look at me for just a second. We read this in the pages of the scripture and we go, oh, what a coward. And then all of a sudden we come to the social media post and we see these things being flashed on the screen here and we see, the map is gone. We, we see, uh, put the, throw the map up real fast for me if you will. We see this area. Okay, there's Gaza, right? Uh, 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 Philistines, Palestine, okay? We see the atrocities that were just committed a week ago and all of these things and the ladies that were being taken and their, their husbands or boyfriends or whatever, they didn't appear to put up the fight. I, I can read this and I can just assume that, that because of the fear of coming over and into this particular area, that he's just trying to cover his hide. I, th I think that the texture, again, just by looking at the video stuff that has gone on over the course of this past week, and, and specifically when, uh, when Hamas came into Israel and did all of that stuff, all of that imagery there, I think we can maybe have a little bit more sympathy on the guy here when he did this. It doesn't, it doesn't excuse the aspect of faith. Will you throw me my bottle of water? a nice void on that uh, recording right there. It's like, boop, okay, cool. <clears throat> so um, a lapse of faith. So uh, we know that just like Abraham was tested, right? This is about 100 years beforehand where, where, where that uh, Abraham had to go through that fa famine. So Isaac never went through any of that stuff. Again, about 100 years later. Yes, it is the son. And, he, and here it is. He's in this place. Uh, and, and as his faith is being tested, we understand this, that he was last seen uh, Genesis 25, 11 at Ber uh, Lohai Royai. Okay, so guess what? Watch this, watch this. Genesis 25, he's right there, Isaac, okay? And, 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 and in the unfolding of this story, what happens? He moved his place to where? Uh, you'd have to flip back to the uh, chapter one or uh, verse number one, right? Where did he go to? There it is. Where's that on the screen? Right there, right? Okay, so, so uh, big boy Abraham, where'd he come from? Uh, at one point, he was at Bethel and I. At another point, we got some stuff in Beersheba. Here's the point, don't miss it. Abraham leaves the farthest part and goes all the way down into Egypt. That is not what Isaac is doing. Even though he shows up with a little bit of a lie there, so, oh, that's my sister. Uh, Rebecca, that's my sister, you know, okay. He is moving closer to the promise. He goes from here, border, to Egypt, and he moves closer into Canaan. He moves up here to uh, Gerar, right there. So he's moving more into the hub of where God had called him to. And what's the lesson for us? It's a very simple lesson. Watch, watch, watch. Don't miss it. The trials either draw us closer to God or move us farther away, depending upon our response to God. That is special, gang. That is powerful. And back in verse number two, again, we're reading this and, you know, we like to think that it's all like, oh, this is one afternoon. No, it's not one afternoon. But back in verse number two, we understand that God had appeared to Isaac for the first time. And, and, and in that, there was that initial response of faith. On the screen is John 14 and 21. It says, those who accept my commands, Jesus speaking, he says, those who accept my command and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my father will love them. And I, watch, don't miss it, and I will love them and, and do what? And reveal myself to each of them. In this chapter here, at the beginning of this, we see that there's a famine. We see that Isaac is taking steps to move. Uh, one more time for the map as you get a chance there. We see that, that, that he's moving closer to the promises. He's taking a step. He's moving from down south and he's going up higher into the land. He's doing that. And, and, and right at verse two, God appeared to him. And you can expect, just like what we read in John 14 from Jesus saying this, you can expect that as you have obedience to the Lord and you walk things out, that you're going to see God show up for you in new ways. That you will sense his closeness in your life. And many times this becomes the struggle of faith. 
Again, we're not dealing with a salvation issue. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to this room as everybody is saved, but what we, we, what we are talking about is growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. What we are talking about is that personal relationship, not salvation. I'm assuming salvation is 100% here, but I know that people go from guardrail to guardrail in the Christian faith, and, 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 and we miss the aspect of fellowship with God and, and, and we miss God doing these cool things within our life, and I can't hear the voice of God, and when I open up the word of God, I'm so confused and overwhelmed by all of this stuff because I'm not sitting through a healthy diet of being taught the scriptures, and so I come to the scriptures and I'm confused. Listen, you're not gonna show up and be an expert in the word of God. You know, I, I've been following Jesus for two years. Woo, what does that mean? You may know a little bit in the New Testament. You might know where it's at in the Bible, perhaps. It doesn't mean much. That's all I'm saying. I, you know, I, it's not a degrading thing. It's a reality thing. You know, it, it just takes time. And so as time went on, uh, 26 and 7, um, again, uh, we, 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 we see as time moves on here um, that what, what Isaac is doing, uh, yeah, he got tripped up in faith, okay? He, he made some good steps of faith there, but he also got tripped up. And, and, and where is his dad? Again, Abraham, he, he made that half-truth. Isaac said, if I'm going to blow it, I'm going all the way in, okay? Um, you know, Rebecca is not his half-sister. She's just straight up his wife, and he just, he just full-on full on dives into a 100% lie right there, okay? And so I want you to understand this point, that as we live by faith, we're living without scheming. But when we start trying to lie, basically what we're trying to do is escape or soften human responsibility. And, and he was afraid for his life in this process, he was, he was afraid that there could be something there. Yeah, he took steps of faith. Yeah, he was moving down south. He was getting closer. God had showed up. God had appeared to him. That was pretty powerful. That's, that's amazing. I don't know the details of all that. I just, it just says that God appeared to him. But that seems like that would be a huge faith builder, you know, if that happens. And yet, we see the, the, the frailty of humanity. The same thing that you and I go through is that we have these great times with the Lord, and yet the, the, the weakness of our human flesh is still there. And as we learn how to live by faith, we are learning how to live by not scheming. We are trying to learn how to live without getting into this place of, of manipulating and lying, you know, because we're trying to either escape or soften our human responsibility. Proverbs 29, it tells us this, that fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting the Lord means safety. The fear of man. We are not to have the fear of man. The application is, is that God has given us a, 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 not a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And when I want to, if I want to quench the blessing, the promise, the strength that God has given, if I want to step away from that, then I begin to fall under the fear of man. I'm afraid to level up with people. I'm afraid. Well, what are they going to think? What are they going to say? Uh, be it a spouse, be it a boss, be it a family member, be it me screwing up in my life, whatever. We're not to fall into the fear of man, period, even when we blow it. And so I want to encourage you, a very practical thing, I want to encourage you to stay away from the half-truths. Why? Why do I want to encourage you to stay away from the half-truths? Because it is the half-truths that has done the damage. It breaks trust, it ruins friendships, and it hurts innocent people. Half-truths. Well, I, I mean, um, technically she was kind of, Sarah was kind of like, you know, his half sister. Yeah, it was a half truth. I understand. And unfortunately, I've seen too much in the church where years of friendship is just tossed to the curb in an instant because of a lie. And gang, we want to stay away from that. And this brings us to our final idea, and we'll close very rapidly with this. Um, idea number three, and that is continuing by faith, verses 17 down through 33 in our text. And so as we wrap this study up, the remainder of this chapter, what does it do? Well, it shows us Isaac and his servants that they're in the promised land, that they're, they're, they're here. And what are they doing? They're digging wells and they're looking for water. Take a look at verse number 17. It says this. It says that then Isaac, he departed from there and he pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and he dwelt there. And watch, and Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham, his father. 
for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. And he called them by the names which his father had called them. It says that Isaac, his servants, they dug in the valley and they found a well of running water there. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, the water is ours. And so he called the name of, of that very first well is, I don't know how you pronounce this. I don't know if it's Isaac, but whatever it is, it just, the idea just means to be, uh, it means to dispute or contention, okay? It says, because they quarreled with him. And then they dug another well. And they quarreled over that one also. And so he called this name uh, Sitna, which means opposition or strife. Verse 22, it says, and he moved from there and he dug another well. This is the third well. And they did not quarrel over it. And so he called his name uh, Rehoboth, uh, uh, Rehoboth, there it is, uh, because he said, for now the Lord has made room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land. And then he went up from there to Beersheba, it says, now the Lord appeared to him again. This is the second time. It was the same night. And he said, I am the Lord God of your fathers, Abraham. Do not fear. I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. And so he built an altar there and he called on the name of the Lord and he pitched his tent there. And, and, and there Isaac's servants, they dug a well. And then Abimelech he came to him from Greer with uh, Ahuzath, uh, one of his friends, and Fecal, the, the commander of his army, and Isaac said to him, uh, why have you come to me since you hate me and have sent me away from you? But they said that we have uh, certainly seen that God is with you. And so we said, let there, be, uh, let there now be an oath between us and between you. And, and let us make a covenant with you uh, that you will do us no harm since we have not touched you and since we have done nothing to you but good and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. And so he made them a feast and, and they ate and they drank and then they arose early in the morning and they swore an oath with one another. And Isaac, he sent them away and they departed from him in peace. And it came, uh, it came to pass that the same day that Isaac's servants came and they told him about the well which they had dug and they said to him, uh, we have found water. Again, this is the fourth well. And so he called it Sheba. And therefore, the name of that city is what? What is it called to this day? Beersheba. We got our map. We're going to throw our map back up, up, up there on the screen right here. Uh-oh. Man, they were on the move. They started out here. They went there. They got pushed out, pushed out, pushed out, pushed out, pushed out. Boom, right there. Beersheba. You see that, okay? That's, that's the fourth well that they dug. It was in that. And so continuing by faith, I, I want us to understand that while he was looking for water, right, and they, they dug these different things, perhaps we can be encouraged by recognizing this. Here, here, here's, here's what it is. Don't miss it that perseverance is still needed inside the will of God. Perseverance is still needed inside the will of God. Isaac dug a total of four different wells as we look through these particular verses, and you'll notice that first half of those things, that there was conflict, that there was still pressure, there was still difficulty, and all that was there. The opposition that he faced. You know, the New Testament tells us that, that all who desire to live godly will suffer persecution, that there's going to be that pressure, there's going to be that pushback, there's going to be that opposition that comes there, and yet God has given us promises, and God has told us in, in terms of what the blessing is and what we get here now in the moment, and the things that we're laying up in heaven, and, and the rewards that we'll get for walking in faith, that, you know, that, that, that's, that's uh, you know, uh, salvation is the saving of the soul, right? So, so our soul is not cast into the fiery lake, which was created for Satan and his, his, his demons, right? His minions there. But salvation is, is, is that, you know, you know, I'm at peace with God the Father through the blood of Christ. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in relationship. That, that, you know, Jesus is my access point, if you will, to get into heaven because I have peace with the Father through him. That's salvation. But the life of faith that we live here and now in this world is what we're, we're sending ahead. As I obey the Lord, that's what's sent ahead. And, 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 and sometimes this comes as a shock to Christians because either they don't read the Bible or they don't understand the Bible or they're not being taught the Bible. I don't, I don't know which one it is. But everybody just assumes we're going to go to heaven, float on a cloud, sing worship all day and all that stuff, and there's no distinction and no difference. That is a lie. That is not true. That there is, a, there is a very radical distinction in terms of what your experience in heaven will be based on what you're sending forward. Now, we're not talking about the salvation side. You're going to see Jesus, okay? Yes, 
Right, you're, you're going to be living in a per- perfect environment, but you can have a saved soul and a wasted life, and you're the dude that shows up in heaven in a Speedo, and you're over there in that little cardboard box, not on the cloud. The cloud is just very, very, you know, I don't even know where the cloud experience came from. You know, maybe, maybe because Jesus comes back on the clouds with the church at the second coming. Maybe that's where we get the cloud experience from. I'm not sure. But do you understand that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth? You, do you understand that God is spirit? Do you understand that, that, that at the second coming of Christ and for the millennial kingdom, a thousand years, you know, touch yourself, okay? You will have a glorified body like Christ, right? You know, still be able to eat. Cool thing is you can walk through walls, I, I guess. I don't know. Jesus did that. That's what Jesus did, so I don't know. Okay, but, but watch. You're coming back to earth. You're coming back to earth. And people, ah, you know, you know, you're going to, ain't nobody in this room lived a thousand years yet. Yeah, in fact, everybody in this room, no one in here has lived a hundred years yet, yet. It's like, well, I don't want to, man. Well, in a perfect environment, when you're with Christ, when, when, you know, listen, you're, the, the, the church becomes the enforcers of righteousness. It's like, it's like your full-time IDF with Jesus' power, you know? <laughs> right, because the world is still rebellious at that, at that point, right? There's a thousand years that is there. We rule and reign with Christ. Physically, from Jerusalem, on this earth. Right, I mean... Uh, I'm on a stage, but you get what I'm saying, okay? Right? I mean, right here. And, and, and people don't, they, they just, they, I don't know, they just mystify the scriptures and we completely miss that. And then when the new heaven and the new earth, you know, when, when, when after that happens and Satan is cast into the lake of burning fire, never again to torment the world again, never. Awesome. No, no, hallelujah, awesome. The same thing, yeah, good thing, okay, good. Well, maybe not the same thing, but you get what I'm saying. There's a new heaven and a new earth. That perfect condition in which Adam and Eve lived within, you know, uh, before they fell into sin. You're not hanging out on a cloud, folks. There is still work to do. There is still things to be done. There is still experiences that you're going to have. The question becomes, though, is that what are you going to do with those experiences? Are you going to live now by faith, storing up in heaven, right? Those are the rewards for living a life of faith now. Not the salvation. Salvation is a done deal in Christ. It's his grace accepted by faith, but it's unto a holy life. And that should motivate the church at this hour because the signs and the signs and the signs, they are there. They're before all of us. And man, if you were to die tonight or tomorrow or next week, whatever it is, you don't know when death is gonna come upon you. You don't know when that happens. Hey, if it happens at the rapture of the church, amen, awesome, and praise the Lord. But if it happens before that, you know, or, you know, uh, you and I are only responsible, not for, our, not for when I'm bored, not for when I go into the grave, but I'm responsible for the dash in between those two points. And as I roll through the seasons of life, I am to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ and I am to understand that this is not just some, uh, I almost said something strange there. Uh, it's not, uh, I almost said fairy fart dust. Okay, that's not what this is. I, I don't know where that was coming from. I'm so sorry, but was, it almost rolled out of me there. I don't, I don't mean anything by that. Uh, this is, this is not some imaginary stuff. Maybe that's a better word to say, okay? It's not some imaginary stuff right here, man. This is, this is, this is, this is the real deal. And, 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 man, sometimes we get a bad rap in the church. And if you're visiting here tonight, God bless you. Thank you for being here. Um, it's kind of an awkward way to, to end. So let me put this verse on the screen. 1 Corinthians 15. Here's what it says. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.